Nate Bazolich, thank you for joining us. Um, first of all, you grew up in Lakemba, which is in southwest Sydney. It's probably the heartland of Muslim Australia, more than 50% Muslim population there now. What was it like growing up there? What impression did you have of Jews and the situation in the Middle East? Yeah, you know, I think when most people look at me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an actor from Hollywood, uh, you know, I'm a Christian, they would probably assume, coming from Australia, that I'd have no real deep understanding of Middle Eastern culture, uh, of the Islamic world, but, you know, growing up in the Lakemba Punchbowl area, I really was, you know, uh, a part of a huge community where I was going to Ramadan as a kid, I was, you know, learning about the Quran and, and how Muslims ultimately do life culturally and religiously. Uh, and it was a very, very different experience. You know, a lot of people, even when I traveled, had no idea that there was such a large Muslim and Arab population in Australia. Um, so for me now, in, in light of what's been happening in the Middle East, in, in Israel and, and the surrounding regions, it's really helped me understand the cultural dynamics. And there is a vast difference between the way, you know, Arab and the Islamic world does life and the way that the Jewish, you know, Christian Judeo values do life. And sometimes those two worlds clash and to understand how those two worlds kind of see things differently and their worldview is actually really, really important to making better sense of the landscape of what's unfolding right now. And what impression did you get from the people you grew up with, your neighbours of Jews and Israel. Yeah, so I had no no interaction with any Jewish people growing up. In fact, you know, my original understanding of not only Jewish people but Israel came from a very Arab Islamic point of view. Um, and so, you know, there was a, a, a deep bias and I would say even uh, a hatred towards the state of Israel and um, Jewish people, you know, especially in Sydney. When you think about out west, there's a large Muslim and Arab population and then you go to the eastern suburbs where the Jewish people sort of gather. And, you know, one of the things, you know, that I didn't really understand growing up is why would I never meet Jewish people? Um, and in light of what's happening in 2023, you actually begin to understand that they're a very closed community but they're also very kind of quiet about their identity purely because of situations like this, because it seems like, you know, even though this war is unfolding in the Middle East and we're here in Australia, the Jewish community has faced such harsh threats and violence um, and, you know, some of the things that happened in front of, you know, the Opera House after October 7th really highlights this deep hatred that many people within the Islamic and Arab world have towards not only Israel but the Jewish people. Speaking of those protests outside the Opera House, and there were also scenes where you grew up in Lakemba uh, of people openly celebrating the October 7 attacks. Mm -hmm. There was a prominent preacher who called it a day of victory. How does it make you feel to see that in your home suburb and in, in your home city? It's shocking. You know, it's, it's shocking and it's disappointing that you know, the vast majority of Australians don't understand what they were actually celebrating. You know, within the Jewish community, everybody was aware of the horrific nature of October 7th. And I think, sadly, mainstream media and, you know, social media today really hasn't been able to amplify the radical violence and barbaric nature of what Hamas did on October 7th. You know, 1,500 innocent, unarmed Israeli civilians brutally murdered, whether they were at the Nova Music Festival, whether they were in the various communities, which are kibbutzim around Gaza. I mean, we're talking about women being raped, you know, children being slaughtered in their bedrooms, families being massacred around their table. And when you see a community of people celebrating that anywhere in the world, it should appall the international community to a point that we really have to address this greater issue that we have. You've made a name for yourself in Hollywood. You left Australia, you, you starred um, most notably in the series The Vampire Diaries and then the spin-off, The Originals. What made you want to take a break from the acting, possibly, you know, as a, prof as a professional actor, you've this is risky for your career and speak out about Israel. What made you want to do that? I went to uh, Israel the first time in 2017. I'm a Christian. Um, it was something that was just 
pulling on my heart to have a deeper understanding of the text that Christians follow, so the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, and one of the most important elements of this God of the Bible, he has a covenant relationship with a very specific group of people in a very specific land, which is the Jewish people in Israel. And I think, you know, one of the saddest realities for, for Christians is we're so disconnected from the Old Testament. We're so disconnected from the foundations of our beliefs, which really kind of amplify all the story that leads to this figure that we believe in called Jesus. And we kind of just focus on the Jesus, but we don't really understand this promise covenant relationship that God had with the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. So I was always really, really curious about understanding that. And what was shocking to me is when I went to Israel for the first time in 2017, I realized that everything I was taught about Israel from not only an Islamic but an Arab point of view was completely wrong. Um, and so often what I found is that the perception that the Arab Islamic world tried to portray Israel as had, I would say, brushes of truth but hide the greater context. And so what they were really trying to do is create this evil enemy in the eyes of the world, which just wasn't there. And so when I went to Israel and I saw the beauty of the Jewish people and I saw how successful the nation of Israel was and how it was actually the one true democracy in the Middle East, it really started to make me think, have I been supporting or been you know, complicit in this hatred towards Jewish people. And, you know, growing up, I heard so many anti-Semitic statements and things said about not only the nation of Israel, but Jewish people all over um, by Arabs or Muslim believers all over the world. So when I really started digging into the history and started pulling out what they were trying to say and seeing the truth of it, it really just started to frustrate me. Uh, so I would vocalize this online and obviously the backlash would be pretty severe um, with, you know, someone who stands for Israel, who supports the Jewish people, there always tends to be a very, very violent response from the other side. You are one of the few celebrities who have spoken out in support of Israel, I mean, even among Jewish celebrities, and then to come from a non-Jewish celebrity, what sort of personal toll has it been, has there been for you since speaking out? I know you've been doing it for a number of years, but yeah. much more frequently even since October 7. It's, it's what you would expect, you know, it's, it's death threats in your DMs, it's um, you know, all kinds of false evils spoken about you in comments and even, you know, people will make TikToks and, and, and other videos just trying to defame you. You know, I think the one thing that the, the pro-Palestinian propagandists want to achieve is they want to discredit you and they want to attack you and they want to give you all sorts of titles so that everyone will stop listening to your voice. So, so often you'll be called Islamophobic um, because you want to support the nation of Israel. And so these are just tactics that they tend to use, um, you know, and, and this kind of really does highlight this greater issue where it's, it's not an open conversation saying, well, let's really look back at the facts and the history of this nation but rather let's you know, use emotionally manipulative driven language to sort of scare the other side into silence. Do you think that's why so many celebrities don't speak out? Absolutely, you know, like, you know, when you think about celebrities and their social media platforms, it's all about generating and continuing the success in their industries. And so any negative press, any negative comments is going to deter them from being successful in what they do. So, you know, it is absolute, it's an absolute strategy of pro-Palestinian supporters to attack anybody who supports Israel in a hope that they would be too scared to lose their reputation or their career or whatever it is that they're sort of working towards. Obviously, you weren't put off by it and you have gone in person and spent a significant amount of time since October 7 in Israel. Why did you want to be there? It's... It was important for me to, to go to Israel because I knew that if I spoke from, you know, my place, I live in the US now, I, I live in, you know, and I spent a lot, I've spent the last 18 years of my life in the US, but if I just spoke from the US, talking on a topic that's in another, you know, continent, I knew ultimately people would start saying, well, what do you know? You know, how do I believe you as opposed to believing people who are, you know, reporting from Gaza or reporting, you know, from the regions that surround Israel? So for me, it was really essential that I was there on the ground and actually had real conversations with people who experienced October 7th and who continue to experience the horrors of what this Palestinian movement has really been over the last 75 years. You know, it, it, it's an interesting 
journey that you take as an outsider from both the Arab and the Jewish world, when you actually just look at it from a critical point of view and you look at the history, you know, there's a lot of flags that the Palestinian propagandists on social media never want people to know online. Like a perfect example of that is the, uh, the Hebron massacre of uh, 1929, where some 63 Jews were brutally murdered in a location called Hebron by the Arab populace then. And that's a really, really important moment in human history to understand that this had nothing to do with the establishment of the state of Israel. And this had everything to do with some deep-rooted generational hatred of the Arab population towards any Jewish presence in the land. And so when you understand that and you have conversations with Arabs all over the world about that, they tend to defer or remove themselves from the conversation because they can't make sense that if they're only upset about Zionism or Israel, why was the same thing happening before the establishment of the state of Israel where we see the exact same violent behavior? behavior. You know, in, at the Hebron massacre, people were raped, stabbed, murdered, you know, shot. And, and so it was the same violence that we saw on October 7th, yet it happened long before the nation of Israel was established. And so this is a generational hatred that they never want the world to really hear about. And so those sort of moments in human history are really important for the Australian population to understand, well, hey, this is not about just Israel. This is about an Arab distaste for Jewish presence in the land, which is their ancestral homeland. While you've been in Israel, um, you've interviewed released hostages, mm -hmm. survivors, the president, the former prime minister, um, families of hostages, soldiers, what have stood out for you as some of the most compelling people that you've spoken to and compelling stories? Yeah, uh, Avi Haim uh, had his children and his wife in Gaza, they were hostages. I, I did an interview with him and and you, you couldn't imagine what it's like to sit with a man uh, in a kibbutz that's not his own. He had to go to another location because he's lost everything because of October 7th. And, and all he has is hope. And every single day he wakes up hoping that his family will somehow be released by a radical terrorist organization called Hamas. You don't know what to say to them. You don't know how to approach the situation, but you, you see that all they have is hope and all you can do is sit with them and, and pray that they will be able to be reunited with their family. Now, Avi Haim was one of the lucky ones. Uh, his family did come home, and that was a very, very emotional moment for me, having known him, having to had the opportunity to have an interview with him, and then hearing about his family coming back uh, was, it was an incredible experience for me. But the one thing that I found that stood out with every single person I spoke to, whether it was the victims' families, whether it was families of hostages, you know, whether it was soldiers, the one thing every single person said to me is, all we want is peace. We don't want to destroy Gaza. We don't want to remove and destroy the Palestinian people. But all we want to do is live in peace and have happy lives. And that stood out to me in such a powerful way because when I looked at the other side and when I looked at what the pro-Palestinian propagandists were saying and what many people were saying in Gaza is all they kept chanting, all they kept wanting or desiring was a complete destruction and removal of the Jewish presence in the land. And so for Australia, when we're unaware of what's really been going on for the last 75 years and we hear statements like from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, we don't fully understand what they're chanting and what they're claiming. But from the river to the sea is a call for genocide of the Jewish presence in the land. And for some reason, we allow chants of genocide now to be spoken in the streets in Sydney, in Melbourne, and all over the world. So it, it's a bizarre point in human history that we're living in where we say, well, racism is wrong in 2023, but racism towards Jews is going to be okay. And war is wrong in 2023, but if it's a war against the nation of Israel, then maybe it's okay. And terrorism is wrong in 2023. But if terrorism happens in the state of Israel, well then maybe there's a justification to it. And we saw that happening in the US when you know the Senate came together to ask questions of these you know, heads of universities and they asked, is the chanting of genocide an acceptable part of your school and code of conduct? And they said, well, it depends on the context. And so the context is this, why is the Palestinian Arab populace of the world allowed to openly hate and try and murder Jews all over the world? How would you respond then to the critics who would go after you and anyone else who supports Israel and Zionism that you are supporting 
genocide. And obviously we're seeing, as we go to air now, as we film this interview, uh, South Africa take mm. Israel to the International Court of Justice with accusations of genocide. How do you re respond to those critics? I would say just do a, do a deep dive in the history of not only the Jewish people, but the state of Israel. Before 1948 and even, you know, the last 75 years, you know, if you did a, a short Google search of the number of terrorist attacks that have been committed by Palestinians, Hamas or Islamic Jihad, just within Israel in the last 20 years, you'll be shocked. We're talking, you know, bombings of, um, you know, Passover dinners, buses, you know, shootings in the streets of Tel Aviv. I mean, I've been in Israel 26 times and uh, every single time I've been there, there's been a terrorist attack. And the sad reality for the Israelis and the Jewish people is they've had to become used to it. They've had to become used to rocket fire from Gaza and random terrorist attacks on the streets of their own cities. And if it happened anywhere else in the rest of the world, every single nation would say enough is enough. We have to cut the head off of the dragon. We have to put this to an end because otherwise our people are going to just be dying innocently. And the sad reality is when you look at the people who suffer most, you know, these Palestinian terrorists who infiltrate Israel or are living within Israel are always targeting women, children and unarmed civilians. You've seen a lot in your time in Israel of physical evidence mm -hmm. of the atrocities of October 7. What was that like? to look at and how does it make you feel when you see all the denials and justifications online for it? Mm. It's, it's sad, you know, and, and I think it's a, we're at a point in human history where we have to make a choice. We either support or be complicit in a radical ideology that has no desire for peace, um, or we actually stand up and say enough is enough. Uh, you know, going into the kibbutzim where, you know, hundreds of unarmed women, the elderly and children were slaughtered is, is something that I'll never forget. And, you know, you walk into these small apartments, these houses that are, ve they're a very, very tight-knit community, these kibbutzim, and they all live around the Gaza border. But a lot of the people that lived in the kibbutzim were really people who were peace advocates. They believed in the Palestinian people that they had a right to a better future. And they were so often the ones who were hoping that there would be a, a future where those who lived in the kibbutz could one day go back into Gaza and trade. And, you know, I mean, there was like 17,000 people who would cross over the Gaza border every day working in these kibbutzim. You know, and one of the most tragic stories that I heard was there was one family that was working with someone from Gaza he would come every single day and, and it was those people who were providing the intel and the information for Hamas to know who was in the kibbutz, how many people were in every single house, how many dogs did they have, how many of the kibbutzim had children working in the army or in the reserves. And they would, they would compile all the information that Hamas needed so when they infiltrated Israel they would know exactly where to go and who to kill and how to kill. And it was the people that they were employing and trying to give better lives that turned against them. So in one kibbutzim, in one house, there was a picture of a family with one of the workers from Gaza, and it was a photo where they're all embracing, seems very nice. It turned out that that same person who was working in the kibbutz was also one of the terrorists who was killed on October 7th. So what do you do with that? What, what do you do and how does a people ever find ways of peace when the very people they're trying to liberate from a radical, violent ideology, which Hamas is educating their generation, their next gen the next generation on, what do you do? You've got a number on a piece of masking tape mm -hmm. on your shirt. Why are you wearing that? So I met uh, Rachel Goldberg uh, during my time in Israel uh, in November and her son Hirsch was one of the uh, hostages who was still in Gaza. Uh, while we do this interview, it's been 98 days um, and so Rachel is one of the most incredible and bravest mothers and women I've ever met. Every single day she made a commitment that she was going to put masking tape and tape the number of days that her son was going to be a hostage. Now sadly we've got to 98. By the time this interview comes out it's going to be over 100. And this is now going to be uh, my daily reminder that as long as the 
pro-Palestinian groups are marching in the streets calling for a ceasefire, they're also not marching in the streets to call for a return of innocent hostages that had absolutely nothing to do with this war. You've, you've had a huge amount of support from the local co Jewish community mm -hmm. in Australia um, because of your stance. What has it been like to come here and see that in person? Yeah, I, I wish there was more Jewish people in Australia that the everyday Australian citizen should, could have an opportunity to engage and meet with them. They're a kind, generous, hardworking, loving community and you know, they're successful. You know, you go to the eastern suburbs and you see where Jewish people live and many of them have had successful businesses or created you know, incredible lives for themselves through hard work, determination, effort, and the ability to, you know, do what Jewish people do best, which is to live and prosper. Um, so I just wish there was more Jewish people uh, in Australia so that the everyday Australian could understand who they are. You know, their voices often get drowned out because they're always the minority. And I think that's the one thing Australia needs to realize. The Jewish people are the minority in this whole story. They're not the majority, they're not the, the aggressor, they're, they're not the oppressor, they're actually, you know, the victim um, of this tragic story where they have been targeted simply for returning to their ancestral homeland. And the irony of that is we're living in a country where every single day we have to talk about and remind ourselves that the ancestral people of this land, Australia, are the Aboriginal people and we acknowledge them and we should acknowledge them. But the hypocrisy of Australia right now is this. We acknowledge that the Aboriginal people were the First Nations people of this land, and yet we do not acknowledge that the First Nations people of the nation of Israel are the Jewish people. History tells us that. And so now we have to ignore history and we have to ignore everything that every single historical book will tell us in favour of a pro-Palestinian movement that was ultimately created in 1964. There is an irony that a lot of that pro-Indigenous movement here mm. seems to be in support of Israel no longer being in existence or the pro-Palestinian movement mm. itself. Um, how do you battle the sort of misinformation that you see online? I know you've also, uh, you know, copped some uh, censorship mm -hmm. through people re mass reporting your account. Mm -hmm. How do you see the online environment and and work with that. Yeah, this is, I think what people need to realize is this is much bigger than just an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The whole world is going to get dragged into what is happening in Israel. And, you know, this involves Russia, this involves Iran, you know, Iran and Qatar have put serious money behind this conflict and they have been clear in their intentions. You know, Iran wants to destroy the state of Israel. And, you know, on, on the battlefront on social media, they have been using bots and they have been using every single tactic under the sun to silence any sort of voice of reason, any sort of voice of logic. So anybody who stands up and supports Israel will instantly be flagged in their system and they will be targeted. My account, when I first started speaking on Israel, was taken down four times. Now, Instagram told me that, generally speaking, you have to get about 100,000 reports to have your account brought down, but I was getting millions. And that's all because Iran, Qatar, and this pro-Palestinian movement is an organized, well-funded movement to silence any voice that would counter their narrative. And what's next for Nate Brizolich? Um, you've got a production company now that you're working with, and you've got a movie. Yeah, so I'm, I'm shooting a movie at the end of uh, January, which is, uh, you know, a movie set in the 1980s about, you know, uh, some detectives trying to find out how to catch out these two corrupt New York cops. Um, and, you know, I've also started a production company called Rover Media, which really was launched uh, post October 7th to combat a lot of the misinformation and the lies that the pro-Palestinian movement continues to perpetuate on social media. And that's one of the advantages that they have. You know, when you look at Hamas, when you look at what they did on October 7th, you also have to understand if they're willing to rape, murder and kill innocent unarmed civilians, they have no issue lying. And many people who are pushing this pro-Palestinian movement have no issue stretching the truth, lying about the truth, hiding the truth. They will pretend, they will present um, content without context. 
And so what I would say that Rover really wants to do is it wants to break the content lie and show the real context of everything about Israel that people need to know about. Because, you know, that's the advantage that, you know, many Palestinian propagandists have. Most Australians have no idea about the Middle East and they have very little understanding about Israel and they want you to stay in that world of ignorance. Because while you do, they can say whatever they want. They can say, well, you know, Israel killed, you know, 23,000 innocent people in Gaza, you know, since October 7th. But who tells us that it's 23,000 people? Well, it's the health ministry of uh, Gaza, which is run by Hamas. So they could put any figure they want in and we have to believe it. And also the proportion of how many are innocent civilians and well, how many are terrorists. The, the IDF say it's almost, you know, 10,000 terrorists that have been killed. So, you know, when you look at that, you don't hear anybody from Gaza, you don't hear anybody from pro-Palestinian who say, well, you know, 10,000 of those people who were killed were radical terrorists who were holding RPGs, um, Kalashnikovs, or they were trying to kill uh, IDF soldiers as they work their way through terror tunnels. You know, the other thing that, that I discovered on my time in Israel when I was talking to, you know, people in the IDF, people who have been in Gaza, is, you know, Gaza itself is about 68 kilometers in length. And underneath Gaza, they have 500 kilometers of terror tunnels. So that's where all the money went. Every single dollar that was funding, you know, aid programs for this Palestinian population in Gaza, it didn't go to them. It went to Hamas, and Hamas built terror tunnels. And will that change if Hamas stays in power? Absolutely not. So the elephant in the room that pro-Palestinian propagandists don't want you to be aware of is Hamas. You get rid of Hamas and then there's an opportunity for peace. As long as they remain, it's going to be the same cycle of hate from generation to generation. Nate Bazolich, thank you for being so generous with your time. Thank you.